Hey everyone, so tonight's gonna be a big video because I'm gonna be walking you through everything you need to know about shooting an interview on a budget. This is especially for people who, if you're not a beginner, maybe you're a bit intimidated by gear. Maybe filmmaking might not even be your main profession. You might be a podcaster, a journalist, it's your first documentary, and you have a desire to up your image quality to get it to that convincing professional level, but you also don't wanna invest in too much gear and get too immersed in that whole process. So what I'm gonna do is break down for you a really minimal setup and really what inspired this video was I've been shooting uh, quite a few interviews lately and I've even had to fly for some on an airplane and I didn't wanna bring so much gear that I would have to put equipment under the plane. So I created a kit that could fit all in my carry-on luggage. And once I shot the interview and saw how well it went for the most part, I thought to myself, you know what? With a few pieces of gear, anyone can really do this if they know how. So that's what I'm gonna to try to break down for you in this video. So the way I'm gonna break down this video is I'm gonna talk about the gear you need and how you should set it up. I'm gonna break the video down in terms of audio, lighting, what camera you should get. But before that, it's important to identify the four types of interviews you might find yourself shooting so that you can identify which one you're gonna fall into or which one you might already fall into. So as far as I'm concerned, there are two main types of interviews, and those are interviews where you're just filming the subject, and those are generally documentary pieces, Netflix documentary type work, where it's really a character piece, it's all about the character. You're gonna interview them, but your voice is gonna be cut out, you're just gonna hear their responses. The second type of interview are those where it's integral that you, as the interviewer, are included in the interview on screen. This could be because you have an audience that's specifically coming to watch your show because you're in it. Uh, it could be because you're up and coming in whatever field and you wanna get your face out there, you wanna build up credibility. Whatever the reason is, it's very important for you yourself to get your face in that interview. And then within those two types of interviews, there are two types of interviewers. Those who have one camera and those who have two cameras. So what I'm gonna do before we get into gear is walk you through each of those scenarios, explain some of the pros and cons of each, and try to steer you in the right direction. The first type of interview is where you don't care about yourself being in the, the interview, you're only filming the other person, you're only interested in their voice on screen, and you only have one camera. This is the simplest type of interview, especially when you're starting out. This is the easiest position to put yourself in, and I really encourage that just to get your feet wet, to get some practice. And you can set up the camera just kind of like I have the camera set up here, straight on. You could also put it at an angle to get something a bit more dramatic. But what's great about this setup is that even though you'll be asking questions to the subject, you'll be standing behind the camera so you can monitor it the whole time. You can make sure that the subject's in focus. You could have your earbuds in. By the way, earbuds are very important to bring for interviews. You always wanna make sure to do a sound test or to check sound along the way to make sure it's going good. But you can do all that while you're standing behind the camera. And that's going to assure that everything is sound on a, on a technical level. Some of the, the drawbacks of this type of interview is that if you only have one angle of the subject, it can get boring if the subject's not super entertaining and you won't really have the ability to cut around. You won't have other coverage to jump to or to move the conversation along. You may have to do unnatural uh, jump cuts. One way to overcome this is to set up your smartphone on a smartphone tripod as a camera. Don't try to make it like a B cam because it won't match and it will feel odd. Try to do it with the intention of, okay, this is the B roll camera just to show the environment we're in. And you can cut away to that whenever you need to get somewhere else in the interview. Like I said, this is a great setup for beginners because you get to focus on all the technical stuff while also engaging in the interview and you don't have to be away from the camera worrying what's going on behind it the whole time. Now, if it's crucial for you to be in the interview as well, you find yourself in situation B where basically you have one camera but it's you and the subject in front of the camera. So how do you pull this off, especially if you only have one camera? So what I would recommend is instead of using that close up on the subject, you get a wide angle lens, ideally like a 24 millimeter, and you shoot a two shot of both of you. 
and it will be your side profiles. You'll be able to see the side of your face. This style, this look is great for a conversational feel. Obviously then the big drawback of this is that if you want those dramatic intimate moments, you don't have the close up of the subject. So that's really where this setup is not ideal. I think if you have a sense that the, the subject is gonna tell an emotional story or open up about something, then the setup in this situation I'd recommend is to have the camera again as a close up on the subject and then use again your smartphone as B-roll to show that you're there. It may not be ideal for you. You may not be portrayed in the most high quality, but at least it will show that it's your show or, or whatever you're producing. For obvious reasons, that's a very limited setup and it's not the most ideal situation. And if you are going to film yourself with the other person, something that's gonna give you more options is if you have two cameras because it will be more dynamic. You can kind of ping pong back between both of you. You'll have coverage. So if the conversation reaches a lull, you could cut away from one of you, jump ahead. You can even, again, use the smartphone to set up as a wide shot B-roll. That will add a lot of production value just to show the big setup of it all but with as many options as two cameras open up um, it also creates a lot of room for error because you now not only have one camera you're not monitoring you have two so not only are you not monitoring these cameras but you're worrying what's going on behind them you're thinking to yourself oh i hope i'm in focus and when you watch the footage back you may catch yourself being self-conscious of whether or not you're in focus and you're going to find yourself cutting away from your angle a lot because you don't want to see yourself on screen worrying about all the technical stuff which in the end detracts from the very purpose of you being in the interview in the first place which brings me to the real cons at the heart of this setup and by the way this is the setup i use for most of my interviews because basically i have this other channel called life examined where i talk to people about whatever the specificities are of their life but i want to be in it because it is my show but i had an experience that really made me realize Sometimes it's just more important to get their story. I was interviewing this older woman. She grew up in the Jim Crow South and she obviously for that reason has quite an intense and unique story. And throughout her interview, while most of it is great, there were times where the audio had distortion in it because I wasn't able to monitor it. She was moving in and out of focus, out of frame. By the way, really essential tip, make sure that your subject is sitting on a still chair so that they can't roll out of frame. It sounds obvious and I was thinking of it while I was setting up the interview, but I just had so much other stuff to worry about that I, I forgot to adjust it. Looking back, I really regret that I put myself in it because even though it's important for me um, to be in those interviews for that series. At the end of the day, it's more important to get that person's story, whatever they're talking about. You know, only do this if it's not coming at the cost of that person's story. For this reason, I'm gonna quickly dip into the gear conversation. I'll come back to it later after, but it's important in certain situations that your camera has really reliable autofocus. If you're using a really sharp lens with shallow depth of field and your character's moving in and out of frame, it's important that the, the autofocus captures their eyes, it follows it. And then as well, it's important that you have a monitor near you, even if it's standing on a stand, just to make sure everything's in frame, you wanna be able to monitor as much as possible at all times. So if you already have two cameras or you're planning on getting two cameras and everything I just told you turned you off, from putting yourself and the subject in front of those two cameras, you can still take advantage of those two cameras if you decide to just only focus on the subject and take yourself out of the visuals. Now we go back to scenario one, where we're completely focused on the subject, but instead of having to choose between which angle we use, we can now use two angles. We could use one straight on, a front profile, and then we can have a, another dramatic angle from the side. And we can now cut around those angles move the conversation along, have more dynamism. The only real con I can think of with this setup is it's just more gear to worry about, more gear to set up. And obviously it's doubly expensive. But the way I feel is if you're monitoring at least one camera and you set up the other camera to the best of your abilities, worst case scenario, something happens with that other camera, you at least have a full interview on 
the camera you're monitoring. So that to me is the most optimal situation if you have two cameras, but if you only have one, you can still conduct a great interview. And I recommend putting yourself in a position where you can monitor the technical side of things. So now that we've identified the four types of interviews and you can kind of grasp where you fit into those or what your shooting style is gonna be when you start interviewing people, you can now follow along with the gear conversation and decide for yourself what is going to work for you in terms of what to purchase and what you're going to need. You're obviously going to need a camera because a lot of you out there already have a camera. I'm going to save that conversation on what camera to get and why for the end of the video um, and talk about other gear because obviously no matter who is watching, everyone here is gonna need to invest in some sort of gear. So the first thing we should talk about is sound because that's the most important part of the production. And I say it's the most important part of the production because let's say you lose all your footage of video, but you still have the audio from the interview, you still have clean audio of a great interview and you could release that as a sound only podcast. But if you lose all the audio for whatever you shot, you can't really do much with the visual. So it's important that you set yourself up to succeed regarding the sound. So in my experience, the best way to get full and rich sounding audio is to use a shotgun microphone. This is a directional microphone that wherever you point it, it's gonna mostly pick up what's in that direction as opposed to like an omnidirectional microphone. And what you would do is put it on any sort of stand and put it as close to the subject's mouth as possible. But there are a couple reasons I wouldn't recommend using the shotgun microphone as your primary microphone. First of all, in order to get good audio from it, you have to get it pretty close to the subject's mouth within a few inches. My shotgun microphone that I'm speaking into right now is just barely out of frame, just above my uh, poofy hair. And by the way, these things can go for a couple hundred dollars. I would recommend not spending too much on one. I know it's an important piece of gear, but what adds price to a lot of them is that um, is the brand name and also a lot of the features they have, but you can get really good sounding mics uh, for less than a hundred dollars. The one I'm speaking into now, if you like the sound of this audio is only $40. It's like the Tackstar SC598 or something. I'll include a link in the description. But anyway, the downside of these is you have to get them pretty close to the subject's mouth to get really good audio. And unless you're shooting a super tight frame on the subject, um, it's very hard to not get the microphone in frame. And to shoot a professional looking interview, uh, that's not gonna be ideal. Now, of course, if you're doing something more casual, like a podcast, for example, where most of the time you see their microphone, then that's not really a problem. But there's one other problem with the shotgun microphone where on podcasts, people know what they're getting into. They know they're coming in and speaking into a microphone. But when you're interviewing someone who might have never done an interview before, they don't know usually as much about microphones as you, so they don't know where to position their mouth and what direction to speak in. And they might be moving all over, similar to the focus thing. They're not thinking in a tech-minded way. So if you have the shotgun microphone in a fixed position, the audio throughout the interview is gonna be inconsistent. So what I would recommend doing is putting the shotgun microphone on a stand, putting it just out of frame and using it as a backup mic. And then for your main microphone, you should use a lav microphone, a tiny microphone that you could either clip to the outside of their shirt or if they're wearing like a button down or something, you could put it on the inside or tape it so that it's not visible. Now lav mics, uh, mainly the affordable ones, they're not gonna get you perfect audio. You may hear some background noise that you need to fix in post, but it's gonna be good enough that with a few minor adjustments in audio editing, it'll be totally passable and people won't question it. The particular lav mics that I recommend are the Rode Wireless Go 2s. There are other brands that have mics that serve the same function, but these are just the ones that I've used. And the reason I recommend them is because they only use one receiver that connects to two microphones. See, most lav mics that I know about basically have a receiver connected to one microphone. So if you were in a situation where you wanted to connect lav mics to yourself and the subject, or maybe two subjects, what you generally have to do is put a receiver into your camera or audio recorder, connect that microphone, and then put another receiver 
into another audio recorder that you'd have to buy and then connect that microphone separately. So like I said, what the Rode Wireless Go 2s allow you to do is only have to put the receiver into one recording device and then you can connect it to two microphones wirelessly on two different subjects. In terms of what recording device you use, um, you should test out before the interview what works best for you. There's some cameras that you can get really good audio in when sending the signal into, but other ones create really tinny and non-professional sounding um, sound. So in that case, you should invest in like a hundred dollar H1 recorder. I'll include the link for that as well. All right, moving on from audio, let's talk about the next important thing and that's lighting. Now this is where we take the kit from something being a massive documentary kit into something pocket sized. People for interviews, for dramatic interviews, use big lights with big modifiers, big soft boxes. And this is definitely stuff you would have to put under the plane, so to speak. But what I'm gonna recommend for this setup is actually a really small, powerful mini RGB light. Now you're not gonna be using the full color spectrum, but I'll explain to you why I'm recommending this light in a second. So anyone who knows anything about lighting might question why I would recommend such a small light source when the way that you get a soft, pleasant look on a subject is generally to get as big of a light as possible, to diffuse it as much as possible, and to bring it as close to the subject's face as possible. And this is, by the way, why a lot of people on a budget will use a window natural light, which is a great idea because it's a very powerful, often diffused, large light source free of cost. But the big problem with using natural light is one, you can't control it. You can't often control the spill in, into the background. The other thing is it changes constantly. So your lighting will be inconsistent throughout the interview. So the reason I recommend this mini light is obviously because you can pack it in your bag and it's so small and portable for a minimal budget lighting setup. But generally I wouldn't recommend it to just shine on the subject's face. That's gonna look bad. It's gonna create a really harsh, flat look. What I recommend is grabbing a really affordable, foldable five-in-one reflector, which will act as a circular, thin piece of diffusion. You can get a grip and mount it onto a light stand. And then you can set up another light stand and mount the mini RGB light on it. And when you shine it through this circular piece of diffusion, you effectively get from this small but powerful light, a larger and softer light source on the subject. And even though it's not gonna be maybe as soft as a regular mono light with a soft box, it's still gonna create a really pleasant effect. And you can see some examples from my interviews that I used this exact setup. And the great thing about it, you can see how small these mini RGB lights are. You can see how foldable the five-in-one reflector are. You can really carry this around you at any time if you need an on-the-go interview. Now, again, if you know anything about lighting and you know about three-point lighting, you may be saying, hey, where's your fill light? Where's uh, your back or hair light? But because we're on a budget here and because I'm talking about shooting dramatic interviews, I don't mind not using a fill light on the other side of the, the subject's face. For example, in this setup right now, to me, I think this looks pretty good. You have a key light on one side of my face and you get this nice contrasty dramatic black look on the other side of my face. And for the background light, you don't even need another light. Yes, I am using an RGB light back there, but on this side, I'm using a practical light, which is like any light you find around the house. And this will just light up the background just enough that it creates separation between your subject and the background. Now, if you really feel the need to have a fill light, you just, that's the you know rules you stick by. What you can do is get another five-in-one reflector mount it on another light stand on the other side of the subject's face and bounce it off the key light onto their face and that will act as a fill light. Now, if you don't feel like bringing any of this diffusion stuff, all you wanna pack is this mini light, you won't get as good of a look, but a, a trick you can do, and I had to do this recently with my brother who's a journalist who was doing a really on the fly last minute interview, is you can take that mini RGB light, which up close is gonna look harsh, and you can move it as far away as you can from the subject with them still looking illuminated. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna make the light softer on them. The biggest limitation with this is that it's still gonna have sort of a flat look and you're not gonna really be able to modify the light the way I am now. As you can see, I've kind of cut it off. I've, I've you know, hid part of my, um, under my chin and the side of my face to really shape my face. 
you're not gonna be able to do that with just the light alone. And for this reason, I recommend a very particular light. Even if you're not gonna use the RGB color function, I recommend it because this brand allows you to do something that I haven't seen with other mini RGB lights. So usually with bigger lights, you're able to shape the light using different tools like a honeycomb grid, more diffusion, and most importantly for our purposes, barn doors, which allow you to decide how much light you want and where. So oftentimes a big problem is when you're trying to create contrast between yourself and the background, you get a lot of spill from your key light. So barn doors allow you to cut that light from the background so it's only going on to you. And while bigger lights have this, basically all mini lights don't have these accessories, but this brand, Bowling, which makes the light, which I think is called the Bowling PL1, which is the light I'm using back there, they create mini accessories for that light. The way I'm keeping that blue light only back there is by using the barn doors. And you don't have to get this. You can get, you know, a light that's half the price without the accessories that's not RGB, but I really recommend it. You'll, you'll really find that you're gonna wanna shape the light as much as possible to shape the look as much as possible. All right, so last but not least, let's walk through the four interview scenarios you might find yourself in and discuss which cameras are gonna suit your needs the best. Now, you might already own a camera, um, but if you're looking for another one, these are things to keep in mind. And even if you don't take my advice for which camera to get, keep in mind the things you should, the features you should be looking for in a camera. Okay, so for scenario one, when you're using one camera and you're only filming one subject and you're operating the camera, the camera that I'm gonna recommend is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. And this is the camera I'm using now. This is the camera that I filmed interviews on. And the Blackmagic Pocket 6K for me would be the perfect interview camera that I'd recommend to everyone, except for one reason, which I will get into, but I'm gonna recommend it in this scenario for the following reasons. The image quality that comes out of this camera is the best image you can get on the market for the price at only $2,000. So if you're not someone who's interested in coloring and you don't wanna deal with coloring at all in post, you can shoot with a LUT or a color profile baked in and not have to worry about anything later. But if you're someone who enjoys coloring, adding a specific tone to your work, you just want the ability to shape it later in case there are any errors, this camera shoots in RAW, so you can adjust things like exposure, white balance, color temperature later. You can essentially build the color from the ground up. Now, nothing's gonna fix atrocious lighting, but if you messed up the exposure a little bit or the colors a little bit, you can fix all of that in post when uh, shooting raw. And this is especially helpful if this interview is fitting into a bigger project and you find that you wanna match the interview to the tone of the project, you'll have a lot of flexibility in post. But besides for image quality, there are a few factors that make this camera amazing for interviews. The first one is that you can charge it while recording, like I'm doing now, like I've done in the past for hours on end. With a lot of other cameras, you can find charging solutions, like you can buy third-party chargers for a bit of extra money or create dummy battery solutions, but that requires buying more gear, worrying about a whole other setup. Oftentimes, if you're not someone who knows about voltage like myself, you risk damaging the internal side of your camera by mixing and matching different battery solutions. So it's really convenient. The fact that the Black Magic comes with a charger that you can record unlimited footage with while plugged into a wall. Now you can only shoot quote unquote unlimited footage if you have a lot of storage. And while admittedly the Black Magic does eat up a lot of storage because it shoots 12 bit color and 6K resolution, the Black Magic is special in that it can record straight to an SSD card like the Samsung SSD T5. Now what's great about these cards is they're really quick in processing large amounts of data. And also they come in a pretty high storage range. So they range generally from 500 gigabytes all the way up to four terabytes. So while you're not gonna get unlimited footage, you can pretty safely leave your uh, Blackmagic recording to a one, two, even four terabyte SSD for a long time without worrying about running out of storage. The other thing that's great about the SSD is how much they expedite your workflow. So you can plug it right into the camera, stop recording, unplug it, and then plug it right into your computer. And because it reads 
large files very well, you can scrub through your footage to check it. Let's say you're taking a break in the middle of the interview and you wanna check on the footage just to make sure it's going a-okay. What you can do is plug the SSD right into your computer and look through the footage. Whereas if you were shooting on something like an SD card, what you'd have to do, take it out of the camera, put it in a card reader or an adapter, then drag it over into a fast hard drive, wait for that transfer to finish, and maybe have the ability to scrub through the footage. Oh, by the way, not only does the Black Magic have these great storage solutions and can charge all day while recording, it also has unlimited recording. And I'm only gonna be recommending cameras to you that have unlimited recording because that's pretty crucial for long interviews. Now, the last great thing I'm gonna mention about the Black Magic is that it takes audio feed really well. I work, help out with a podcast and we run a mini XLR into the Black Magic for all the podcasts and the audio sounds incredible. It sounds flawless. Right now, I'm running this $40 shotgun microphone into the Black Magic's other audio port, which is a 3.5 millimeter jack, and it sounds great. Now, the reason I bring this up is because even though you can record audio to a lot of other cameras, a lot of mirrorless cameras really can't interpret or receive the audio in a good way. It will still sound quite bad, and that's why I was saying earlier, you should always check before the interview if that's the case and if you have to get a separate audio recorder. So the Blackmagic at this point sounds pretty perfect, but why wouldn't I recommend it for all scenarios? Um, and that's for one big reason, and that is because it doesn't have autofocus. Now, generally, I don't care. I like to focus manually when shooting stuff you know, for artistic purposes, but when you are setting the camera down and you're not able to monitor the camera all the time and you need the camera to follow the moving subject and their eyes, you're going to need really reliable autofocus. Now, the reason I recommend the Black Magic for our first scenario of interviews is because you'll be behind the camera able to monitor it, make sure it's in focus and all that stuff so it won't matter as much. So for the rest of the interview scenarios, I'm gonna be recommending only Sony cameras because they are known to have really reliable autofocus along with Canons, but Canons, the affordable ones, mostly have a 30 minute recording limit, whereas these Sony ones that I'm recommending don't and they're quite affordable. Now I'm gonna recommend very affordable cameras for those scenarios, but before I do, I'll just say that anyone has a budget, the camera, the do-it-all camera that I recommend for all of these scenarios Scenarios is the Sony a7 IV. It's a pretty new camera. Unlike the other ones I'm gonna recommend, it can shoot 10-bit internal color, which means it's gonna have a much more professional, customizable in post image than the other cameras. You can still get great images on the other cameras, but this is just on another level. And it has better, more sophisticated autofocus, and of course benefits from all the other features of other cameras I'm gonna recommend. The main reason you wouldn't wanna get this camera is because it's $2,500, and that's probably a big investment for a lot of people, especially if you wanna get two cameras. But keep that in mind, if you do have the budget, that is the camera I recommend. But moving on to some of the more affordable choices. Let's go to scenario B. We have one camera, but you want yourself and the subject in frame. For this scenario in particular, I would recommend the Sony a7C. And the reason I do is because to my knowledge, this is the cheapest Sony camera you can get that's full frame. So for those of you who are just starting out with the camera stuff, just a little background on full frame. The reason that there are a lot of really high quality affordable cameras out there is because manufacturers are able to make cameras with smaller sensors for less money, but still retain that high quality, but they're what are called crop sensor cameras. So there are generally two popular types of crop sensor cameras. There's APS-C, which crops in roughly 1.5 or 1.6 times. The Black Magic is APS-C. That's why it could shoot such good quality at such an affordable price, or at least that's part of it. And then there are micro four thirds cameras that crop in two times, which the Black Magic 4K, which is even cheaper, is a micro four thirds. Now, the, one of the big issues with micro four thirds, especially with interviews, especially if you want a wide angle, is that if you're in a really tight space because you often can't control your shooting location, micro four thirds is gonna crop in two times. So if you are using a really wide angle 
that's suddenly gonna become a mid-range angle and you might not be able to fit both subjects in frame comfortably. So I really recommend for scenarios where you know that your shooting style is gonna be a wide angle to get a full frame camera that is gonna give you more space and more options in terms of wide angle lenses. So Sony a7C for scenario B. So let's move on to the next scenario we talked about, which is where you're using two cameras and again, both you and the subject are in frame. And in this scenario, I'm going to again recommend the Sony a7C for one of your cameras because in case you decide to take that option where you use the other camera as the close up and you want a B roll or a second camera as a wide angle lens, that full frame will still give you that flexibility. And then we also have to take expense into account. You know, not everyone can afford two really expensive cameras. So for the other camera, I'm gonna recommend the cheapest of the options, still really solid image quality, very famous vlogging camera, which is the Sony ZV-E10. So you have one full frame camera and then you have one really affordable camera that will produce similar, if not identical images. Now for the next scenario, we have another setup where we have two cameras, but we don't necessarily need full frame because we now have more flexibility on our side of the court. So I'm gonna recommend for one of these cameras, the Sony ZV-E10. For the other camera, I'm gonna recommend one that is a few hundred dollars more expensive, which is the Sony A6600. Now, if you're on a really tight budget, you can just get two Sony ZV-E10s together. They come out to like 14 or $1,500, whereas this option I'm recommending will come out to more like 2,000. The reason I recommend this is because it's a bit redundant to get two of the same cameras. Of course, it'll be useful, but I assume you have maybe a camera life outside of interviews. And by just having a different type of camera, it'll give you the flexibility to do other sorts of work. Let's say, for example, you wanna do handheld stuff, right? You're interviewing people on the street and you wanna do handheld. The Sony A6600 compared to the Sony ZV-E10 has a much better image stabilization because it has in-body image stabilization, whereas the ZV-E10 has a lesser form of IS, which is digital image stabilization, kind of working with the lens, not actually stabilizing with like mini gyro gimbals inside the body, however all that stuff works. So anyway, those are my camera recommendations. Last but not least, you can't forget about lenses. Without getting too much into it, the lens, the main lens I would recommend is a 50 millimeter. It's the perfect focal length for interviews. It's not too wide where the subject is looking distorted in a way, but it's not too long of a focal length where you're trying to make them look like a photo shoot or a model. It's just that perfect middle ground where you're tight, but you can see the environment, they're in the background. They look flattering, they look dramatic, but they also look down to earth. Obviously, if you are shooting in those scenarios where you need a really wide angle lens, I'd recommend a 24 millimeter lens. These two lenses together are cheaper than the average single lens and also smaller than the average single lens. So it's ideal for traveling. You can bring them wherever you go. Anyway, I'm rambling. We could go on and on about this. If you have a shoot tomorrow or whenever it is, whenever you wanna jump into these interview sessions, I really hope this helped you. I really hope this helped all of you out there. I made this video because I'm not a complete expert on interviews. It's something I'm dabbling with, but as I go along, I learn this stuff and I see that really anyone can do it if you know the steps and you put your mind to it. So I hope all of you go out and get great interview footage and please share it with me.